Good evening and welcome back to the 11 o'clock waffle. We are one episode away from discovering the Doctor's name, one match away from saying goodbye to the Ferguson tenure at Manchester United, and exactly one waffle away from learning who this week's winner will be. So, on this week's waffle, we have two debutants and a veteran. From the degree that bought you legendary wafflers Edgar Duncan and James Miller, Lucy Ahmed and Emma Freus, and last week's Tony Gale, may introduce our smallest ever contestant, the lovely Jenny Roberts. Hey, good to be here. Hello. Hello, how are you? Hello, hello. I'm I'm really, really well. Had a great day. You okay? Yeah, yeah I'm good. You got good weather? Yeah, yeah, it's been lovely. Please, guys. Also making their debut this week, taking time out from rehearsals to be here, from Feckles, it's Matt Shrub Fifield. What's home? How are you today, Shrub? Uh, I'm very well, albeit tired of uh, very well. Excited to be on the waffle? I'm very excited to be on the waffle. The whole thing is great. So first of the new batch of the Fecklers as well. And lastly, she was here on the very first episode over two years ago. <laughs> Last time out on her sixth appearance, she finally recorded her first ever win. Since then, she's become a master of the arts, making her the most educated person on the waffle yet. Lords and ladies, it's Carla Smith on the show. Woo! Hello! How are you? I'm good. How are you, Carla? I am good. I am cool. We're happy that the, wa- that the waffle is back. <laughs> okay, let's begin, shall we? Yeah. After Wigan beat Manchester City in the FA Cup on Saturday, what is the greatest ever giant killing? Carla. Damn you for choosing me that. You are um, the most experienced guest on. Yeah, that took me a many good. Um, I went for a few answers with this, but in the end, I kind of thought I'd go with Luke Skywalker versus, like, the Empire, because he is quite literally the underdog against this mass evil, and... Everyone likes Star Wars, so I've got many points. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pretty much, that's it. Shrub, what have you got? In, in my sort of lack of preparation, and I found it really uh, difficult to come up with any particular giant killer, uh, particular sort of film that left to mind. So I, I was just going to stick to uh, jolly old David in the Bible. Um, perhaps not the most original choice, but, but certainly uh, the most resonant and, and the original giant killer indeed. I mean, that Goliath would seem like a very nice one. Okay, Jenny, what have you got for famous giant, uh, greatest ever giant killing? Um, I went, like, shrub, I went quite literal with it, and um, I had a look at Greek mythology, because, obviously. Um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, before the gods in Greek mythology, there were Titans, and the leader was Cronus. And uh, he was frightened by this prophecy that he was destined to be overthrown by his own sons. So every time his wife gave birth, Cronus would eat the baby, because um, abstinence was clearly out of question. And um, after she got pregnant with this, for the sixth time, Cronus' wife decided that she was tired of this, it was weird. And she wrapped a stone in a blanket, pretended it was a new baby, and gave it to Cronus to eat. And this plan went off without a hitch, because of course it did. And uh, the surviving baby was the Greek god Zeus. And uh, Zeus was sent off into hiding and raised by a goat. And when he grew up, Zeus poisoned Kronos, forcing him to vomit the devoured children, and who became the gods Demetia, Hera, Hestia, Hades, and Poseidon. And they released some other titans Kronos had imprisoned, and there was a big war, and Kronos was overthrown, and the gods took over the universe. And um, so I know they're gods, but the five of them were regurgitated... And the other was raised by a goat, so I think that's a pretty good victory. Jesus, Jenny! I, 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 <laughs> I could never have completed with that. No, and there's, I, um, and there's loads of weird, dark paintings of Cronus eating his children, so I quite like it. Why did it take her five babies to work out that you know, Cronus eating the babies was a bit weird? I don't know, I think the, the whole stone plan was a bit of a long shot, so I think maybe she was getting a bit desperate. It worked, though. Yeah, I, I like that story. I do. Is it always, is it always this lighthearted? <laughs> um, uh, not, no. not unless Edgar's on. If Edgar's on, it does yeah. tend to go quite dark. <laughs> Question two. It's been revealed this week that 75% of the BBC's daytime shows are repeats. The reason being it keeps costs down and provides funding for fresh content. Unless you're a daytime show, that is. But what television show that is no longer an air would you be happy to see repeated daily and why? Shrub, we'll come to you first on that. Bagus. Um, 
that um, it's a, a beautifully sort of surreal uh, children's television program, but it's so full of whimsy and wonder, and you, you can only marvel at its brief run of how many different possibilities that the, the lovely mice who every year, every week would, would find an object and speculate on its on its origins and its and its use and its significance by putting a, a reel of music in a, in a wooden organ and proceeding to sing in very high pitched voice while uh, a bizarre frog like creature plays a banjo and a sort of rag doll does only what can be described as some sort of jittery body popping, all while a, a, a giant woodpecker bookcase, and apparently based on the, uh, it was inspired, uh, inspired by the uh, well-known philosopher Mr. Bertrand Russell, produces in sense called rambling, and uh, while this, being the centre of the entire thing, this cloth-eared cat just sits there and, and occasionally yawns and contributes nothing to the city. And all this fun is, is over something as simple as a lollipop or a shoe or something. It, it's, um, you know, in our, in our modern times with issues of, of pollution and, and littering and, and, and people not being able to find a place in this world and where material possessions become so much to us and become so important, I, I feel that in order to lighten our mood a little, we, we need a, a ten minutes every every day indeed of, of a, a group of whimsical children's television characters to, get, to try and find a place for everything. Right, okay, good answer. Carla, what have you got? I've been watching a lot of daytime telly since coming back from America in a lot of kids' telly and I've, that not my own choice, my nephew's always here but um, I want to bring back Rainbow. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just such a great show, and if you watch kids' telly these days, it's just full of innuendo for the adults, always. Thomas the Tank, especially, is just full of it. Oh, what are you talking in, about? <laughs> the amount of times they go through tunnels, tunnels in nothing, in everything, and it's just nobody does innuendo better than Rainbow. It really doesn't. I mean, if you, on YouTube, there should be an episode somewhere of, like, them yeah. using musical instruments. Yep. Yeah. But it's just oh, like they're asking Jane can she blow on Thingy's flute and she says she can't because she was on Thingy's flute last night and oh it's just I didn't brilliant. say anything wrong with that at all <laughs> I think that's just you yeah. I didn't see what's I don't know what just, please about. watch it watch the episode it's just I, absolutely full of it every sentence is amazing I'm aware of, of the references to twangers and, and, and saying that if you, if you can't if you can't play with your balls then ask a friend if you can play with his that's the one. Yeah, that They're one. all damaged. That's Jenny, what TV show would you bring back? Um, for me, it's Twin Peaks. Oh, um, oh, <laughs> it's really iconic. It led the way for a lot of TV dramas we have on now. And the second season is really odd. Um, and it was cancelled before a lot of the weirder subplots could be cleared up. Um, like the weird phantom hand syndrome that was spreading through the town. People's hands would just start spasming um, and we never found out why. So I think if it was broadcast daily, then people might get used to the stories and we could come together as a nation and share theories about what was going on and it would be beautiful. I never liked the soap opera element of the, the sort of who's baby is subplot amongst all the sort of the weird Carl Bluff and more David Lynch and stuff. I always find that yeah. irritating, but I feel it's, it's meant to serve some... I feel like someone is going to tell me that it serves some sort of integral purpose or whatever, but it was just... As, as opposed to sort of David Lynch's films, I, I found Twin Peaks somewhat sort of disappointing. I like the weirdness of that combination, and I think the characters are strong yeah. enough to keep it going, but I can it, see why that would be annoying. It, I suppose it brings out the whole sort of suburban weirdness thing. You, you blend sort of supernatural, surreal happenings with, with sort of... Yeah, the small town yeah. thing, yeah. Okay. Question number three. My clone's car was covered in eggs and flour as a prank by his teammates prior to his final ever home game as a footballer. So what prank are you most proud of, Jenny? Um, when I was about 14, I used to drink a lot of canned fizzy drinks and I used to pull the ring pull off and put it in the drink and drink it. And uh, one of my friends said she was always um, scared that I'd choke. So one day I downed the drink in one and I pretended that I was choking <laughs> while she looked on in horror and then I laughed in her face. So I'm not, I'm not big on pranks, but I am a terrible person. Okay. To be fair, she, like she didn't try to help me at all, so... 
Oh, okay. <laughs> That's probably why we're friends. Shrub. Less of, I, I suppose, less of me playing pranks and more of um, pranks played on me are the more notable ones. I, I, I've racked my brains all week to try and think of amusing pranks that I've pulled, or at least have been part of collecting. The only one I can think of is when, uh, when I was at school, uh, my, my class um, kidnapped two small children and hid them in a cupboard in, in my geography room, and then we <laughs> proceeded what? to make my... Um, <laughs> That's dark. Sort of, <laughs> I, I used this light-heartedly, and then um, we, my, my geography teacher would come in, none the wiser, and um, would proceed to <laughs> often go off on tangents, went off on one uh, about the, uh, the infamous Darwin Awards, um, which, for anyone who doesn't know, is, is, is um, a sort of website awarding people for ridiculously stupid ways of committing suicide. We, we eventually coaxed him into telling this story about a man who, who decided what would happen if he inserted a petrol pump the wrong way round in, in, into the sort of bit of in the person where one should not put a petrol pump. Described in graphic detail what happened, and then at that exact moment, these two children decided to run out screaming. And, and it, it, was, it was an embarrassing affair. I, I could probably uh, top the list of, of funny of pranks in terms of, and again, not a prank. Okay, C- Carla, what's what's the best prank you've ever pulled? I don't really do that much in the way of pranks, but I've always kind of, well, my mum's a massive worry what, and I've always kind of threatened that one day, if I'm out and she rings too much, basically, I would get a friend or a stranger to answer it and to just answer it saying, oh, sorry, we found this phone in the wreckage. Who are we speaking to? In I've just always kind of really evilly likes that idea even though it's very very mean That's we're all very we're not this is all quite dark none of us yeah. are nice people at all but you've never done it no god no i wouldn't <laughs> dream of it she'd score so we kidnapped children we pretend to um, choke to death yes and we pretend to just die we take oh, advantage we... of our mother's love and yeah. we all say we're not big prankers as well <laughs> I find interesting. Yeah. We're not prankers, we're just awful people. <laughs> Maybe it's best that we're not. Yeah. <laughs> At the back of the grid, after the first round of questions, Carla and Shrub on nine. Fair and enough. Pipping ahead into the lead, it's Jenny on eleven. Eleven, not bad. It's because you put so much thought into the first question. It's just a great answer. Thanks. So, a couple of shout outs now. Anytime. Um, we are on Facebook, the 11 o'clock waffle. There's the Twitter page, uh, which is being run by Chris. Again, 11 o'clock waffle. And we bizarrely are being followed by the official Aston Villa Football Club Twitter feed now, which is just really random. <laughs> um, if you've not heard last week's episode, it's, it's up on YouTube now to listen to Inglorious Pop Tarts. And the one before that, for a few waffles more, that's available as well. Question four now. And Disney has faced criticism after sexualising the heroine of Grey, Princess Meridia. An online petition has been set up against this and argues, by making her skinnier, sexier and more mature in appearance, you're sending a message to girls that the original, realistic, teenage-appearing version of Meridia is inferior. So give me other role models for women. Shrub, we'll start with you. Ah... Again, this is a question that I I um I had difficulty thinking of. So I, I was I was just gonna um I, I I'm gonna be boring and go from the the story of from news this week of of Ms. Angelina Jolie, somewhat heroic or fair, a, a sort of media or fair of the word I I can't pronounce. Mastectomy. Uh, yeah. That, um. Obviously, I mean. There is, it is sort of debatable as whether it's heroic as opposed to, say, a sort of elderly lady from, from Norfolk having the same procedure. And it's, it's drawn a lot of controversy from, from sort of, you know, I, I, I glanced at the headlines of the tabloids today and, and, it, and it appeared sort of more blown up and more proportional than it perhaps should have been. It's, it's the sort of ex- excess publicity that I, I, I think is being attached to it rather than being sort of presented by it. But um, I, I think it's it sort of, it, it's almost sort of modest and while, while sort of strong at the same time. I, I think for someone who's built up a reputation as, as a sort of, as, as, as a sort of figure in, in terms of sort of objectively seen as attractive, whether that's going to conscious or not, it's, it's, it's a bold move, you know, how to find that. Okay, Carla, female role models. Oh, I didn't know, I don't like most female people in the public eye. 
Um, I kind of, it's going to be an obvious answer, but I'm going to go for Jennifer Lawrence. Um, she won the Oscar this year, um, the Silver Linings Playbook, and it's just, it's not really for that, but it's because she just seems very down to earth and very kind of just normal. Like she's kind of not afraid to be clumsy or to kind of talk about things that just make her seem quite human. Yeah. Whereas a Whereas a lot of like actresses seem to have this perfect image, and then she's like, "Yeah, I, I mean, how she got starstruck over Jack Nicholson. I love that clip. But to be honest, I, I don't like my female role models. They just always seem too perfect. And role models should be someone who's not perfect, but someone who kind of faces their demons head on. So I really didn't know how to answer this properly, really. Okay, Jenny. Um, I went with an actress as well. Um, I went with Anna Mae Wong. She was born in 1905 and she was the first Chinese American movie star. And um, she was cast in these very stereotypical racist, sexist roles. Um, and she did really well. Um, she, you know, achieved stardom, but she refused to be satisfied with that because she just wasn't happy with the role she was given. And uh, she... She spoke out about it and she said, why is it that the screen Chinese is always the villain? And so crude a villain, murderous, treacherous, a snake in the grass. We are not like that. How could we be with a civilization that is so many, so many times older than the West? I think she was incredibly smart and talented and um, she wouldn't stand for what was wrong, even when she could have really easily used it to her advantage um, at that time. And this week, I think Lucy Liu also said that there was no way that she could ever really be cast as a romantic leading lady possibly because of her race, that people just don't see, people still don't see um, non-white women as a, as a leading lady. They still get typecast. Um, so That's I think quite true, actually. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of still going on. And she saw this even when she was the first ever um, Asian American film star. And I think she's a great example that women shouldn't just go along with the status quo and keep their mouth shut. Um, but if they do get any celebrity or platform, then they should use it to change things. Um, I think she was remarkable. I think she was great. Jenny's um, research is really paying off in the scores. <laughs> <laughs> Question number five. Richard Branson dressed up this week as an air hostess on one of his Virgin flights after losing a bet with Tony Fernandez. But who do you think would make a decent air hostess? And this is just a one name at the time, people. So, Carla. You. Sorry, you always look good in a suit. I think you'd love kind of looking the part. Sorry. <laughs> Jenny, <laughs> you say one. <laughs> you say one name at a time. Yeah, just a one namer. Because I was gonna go for a cross between um, John McClane and Jesus. Awesome. <laughs> I've got a friend who's an air hostess, <laughs> and she's like, we're just glorified waitresses. But you have you have to be prepared for anything between a terrorist attack and an asthma attack. Like she'll turn around and say, oh yeah, this guy forgot his meds the other day on the plane. I had to deal with it. Because there's no one else. You're not going to call 999. No. I, I think it's way more than just the fake tan, the designer uniform. I think you have to be really... I have a lot of respect for cabin crew. You have to be great at first aid. You have to be counsellor. Oh, no, it's true. Because you have to of prevent the, terrorist attacks. Yeah, because yeah. of their hostess as well. And it's just... You don't realise kind of how hard a job it actually is. How much yeah. you have to cover. It's crazy. Sure. But no. um, I, w- I was going to answer roundabout with, with someone who is afraid of flying. Mm-hmm. to shake things up a bit but I, I'm just going to go for my stock answer of, of Brian Blessed is people would actually <laughs> bother, people would actually bother to listen to the safety in us. I say listen <laughs> um, have it forced down their ears whether they like it or not I can hear it it's horrible like brilliant but horrible Let, let's make That'd that be happen fantastic. He'd have he'd have like the dress and everything as well. He'd have like the the sort of typical air hostess dress. Your exes are here and here. It'd be amazing. <laughs> and here. <laughs> Olivia Coleman won two BAFTA awards on Sunday, one for Best Supporting Actress, the other in her comedy role in 2012. So what other comedic actors or actresses have put in memorable drama performances? Jenny? Um, I really like comedies that have dramatic moments in them. Um, I think a lot of British comedies do that really well, like Green Wing and One Foot in the Grave. And I've been watching um, Grandma's House by Simon Amstel lately. And um, it's kind of about a hack comedian slash presenter who wants to be a serious actor. And so I think it's interesting that there are kind of quite poignant dramatic moments in that, like especially at the end. So I'd say Simon Amstel. Okay. Uh, 
Carla, next. Um, I watched a film this week, actually, called Rain Over Me. Oh, yeah. And it's that, got Adam Sandler Adam Sandler, in it. yes. Well, is that the one Play. after Twin Towers? Yeah, his um, wife and kids were on one of the planes. Adam Sandler is just known for, like, these really crappy, like, comedy films. I mean, Big Daddy and Happy Gilmore, they're all right, but the rest, not so great. But seeing him in it, in kind of, you just totally believe him in... At the end, you kind of wish that he does more dramatic roles. I mean, he kind of used his shouty thing to, you know, in a really good way. And he can put on the tears. He can, he just really did this great thing. I might give that a look because I hate Adam Sandler comedies. I I, I might I, like him more if I see him in a dramatic role. Yeah, he still he's still has so a shouty thing, but kind of in a dramatic way. <laughs> and he's like, bless it again. <laughs> yeah. But he kind of does the whole depression, like, you totally believe him, and it's just, yeah, I was a little bit blown away by him, to be honest. It's a big Ooh. answer at a big time for Carla. Ah. Shrub. Drama performances by comedy actors. Not being a film buff, I'm slightly ashamed to admit that I've only seen one film featuring the great, uh, renowned and, and probably very well-known silly comic actor Robin Williams. That film being One Hour Photo. Um, That's a great performance. It is, yeah. yeah. If anyone hasn't seen yeah. it, it's a, it's a film about this sort of dera- um, sort of very odd, eerily odd sort of guy who works the photo booth, uh, no, the photo booth, sort of photo counter in a, in a department store who who is sort of stalking this family and, and as it's presented sort of stalking their sort of son in particular and as I recall it was a while ago that I saw this that eventually transpires that he, he sort of re- discovers that the father of the family is having an affair and, and sort of attempts to, to sort of stop it in a very weird way but it's, it's, it's a very powerful and moving performance because there are a lot of very it's, it's a very psychological film and there are lots of very sort of strange dreams involving this one moment where his eyes start bleeding or whatever but it's it, for someone who's sort of so well known for being sort of zany and eccentric and I think the only other thing I, I remember Robin Williams from is, is, is the genie in Aladdin which is the sort of epitome of, of, of sort of film zany to deliver something so sort of restrained and cold and, and just it, it's not sort of terrifying or, or even creepy it's just eerie is the way I describe it and it's, it's a really fascinating performance and a very good film okay and I, I also, also good, very good in um, Good Morning Vietnam. It's another good performance by Robin Williams. Uh, yeah, Dead Poet Society. Dead Poet Society. Yeah, that is quite comedic, but it's it's touching as well. Good Will Hunting as well. That's a good in. Mm-hmm. So six questions in. It's time for the scores. Hello. Trailing, uh, in, trailing in last place on 15 points, spectacularly shooting herself in the foot by forgetting that you do not insult the host on this one. It's Carla. I said it because you'd look good in a outfit. Come on. In second place on 20, Aww. it's Jenny. <laughs> narrowly ahead on 21 in the lead, it's Shrub. Huzzah! In all fairness, I never win these things anyway. It's time to do the, the teaser question now, uh, which goes up on our Facebook and Twitter pages every week. Um, so this week uh, we had a question about um, greatest, and, greatest and worst cover songs. Fantastic response again on there. Chris has picked this week's winner. Um, Tony's won it again. Chris will be going all the way up to visit Tony to spend a day with him as his prize. He's um, going to love that. He's going to love that. Uh, Tony I wish I could be a fly on the wall for that. Oh, I Two very big personalities. One of them needs to have a camera in this... It needs to be a yeah. documentary. T- yeah, Tony yeah. won by picking Johnny Cash's Hurt as the greatest cover of all time. Um, other mentions, Chris cutting us went with um, all William Shatner covers. Uh, we've got Don't Go Breaking My Heart by Macy Gray. Yeah, that was only put on there today. Got that. That's uh, a good one. Yeah, indeed. See, Sinead O'Connor, Nothing Compares to You. Very, very good. Uh, anything by Jedwood. <laughs> um, Always the, a great show. The Batman theme by Pomplamoose. That one I didn't see. That one I need to listen to. Question number seven now, and this is again, this is just going to be a, a short answer. After the latest series of Doctor Who was accidentally released to a few fans who had pre-ordered it three weeks ahead of schedule and a week ahead of the finale, 
bosses are urging them not to release spoilers. The final episode is of course called The Name of the Doctor. So what do you think his name is, Shrub? Doctor. <laughs> Doctor. Uh, an alternative name. But... Carla, what have you got? Adolf. <laughs> <laughs> not be spoilers. That would be a twist. Jenny. Sydney Newman. Oh, very clever. Better. Wait, why Sydney Newman? Uh, he was credited with creating the concept and character of Doctor Who. Oh, cool. So, um, the author isn't dead, but I thought it could be not just blowing the time and space, but reality and fiction as well. I'd watch it. No one else would watch it, but I'd watch it. If you, I'd watch it. If you tune into next week's show, we'll have Alex back, and he'll be able to give us the full biography of Sydney Newman and the full you, history of 50 years of Doctor Who. I was going to say, do you have an extra hour set aside for that? A special exclusive. We, yeah. We, we yeah. are, of course, later in the year going to be doing a sci-fi special in honour of Doctor Who reaching 50 years. Of course. Uh, that will be coming up later in the year. Question eight, the final question before we enter our final round. So Alex Ferguson has one more game remaining as Manchester United manager and took charge of his final home game on Saturday. But what other examples are there of champions bowing out at the top? Carla, start with you on this one. I'm going to go Ricky Gervais for kind of everything he writes. Uh, the Office in extras, he kind of always ended them. He ended both on just like a high with people wanting more. I mean, the amount of actors that have said... if you know bring back extras I want to be in it and he's just said no because he doesn't want people to get tired of it and he doesn't want it to kind of get worse yes he was my answer shrub I um, I completely forgot about this question and hadn't prepared an answer but, uh, Carla, Carla is just sort of nudging the sort of comedy vein he's made me think of John Cleese um, who of course bowed out of Monty Python's Flying Circus when he feel he'd, uh, he'd sort of achieved his greatest moment and, and the show sort of um Sort of reached its pinnacle, and also, of course, then went on to create Forty Towers, which he himself fairly ended after only two series, uh, where he himself admits it couldn't have gone any further. Um, I think this sentiment is particularly prominent in a very good sketch in the Secret Police Ball, in which Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie uh, present him a mock, present him with a mock award, and then deride him for basically his multiple failures and. and setbacks and, and personal indiscres- uh, indiscrepancies that have plagued him since taking Fawlty Towers off the air, which results in John Cleese acting, presumably, um, by rolling around on the floor, crying like a little, um, like a little baby. So I, I, I'm continuing the comedy vein, but taking it a step further by, by saying this to John Cleese. There. Okay, and Jenny, last of all. Harper Lee. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, she wrote um, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, instant bestseller, won a Pulitzer Prize, um, considered one of the most important works of literature, both in storytelling and politics. And you're going to write any more, Harper? No, I don't think so. She's just written nothing else. <laughs> and just She might still do. She's still around. Um, Is she? She's, she's very elderly. Um, she's in yeah, a court just... case at the moment. About yeah, the right I, I, I see that. She is, yeah. Oh wow! She's never she's never made any speeches or done any interviews or anything. Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. the questions for this week's show done. It's time for the final scores ahead of the final round. Mm-hmm. Trailing at the back on twenty four points, but just still in with a chance. It's Carla. Yeah, knew it would be. 26 points, it's Shrub. Yeah. And just ahead in the lead, it's Jenny on 28. Which uh, means clawing my way back in. It's still to play for. So Come on, Jenny, I believe in you. The final round now. And I don't so believe the... in me. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Let's have a, a short group hug before we continue. Short counselling session. I'm I'm sort of actually got my hands out just around the screen of the laptop. I think that's just you. Yeah. (laughs) Sit down, Carla. I'm sorry. I just want to be. I love you. I love you too. (laughs) I'm just emotionally done inside. Okay. (laughs) For the final round, that will require the contestants to present a news headline followed by a 15 second summary of the story. The story will either be true and something from the past week's news, or it will be completely fabricated. The other guests then have to guess, have to work out whether the story is fact or fiction. There's two points on offer per question. So, 
Jenny, you're in the lead. Can you get the order in which we run? Um, I'll go first, and okay. then Shrub, then Carlo. Okay. Bring it. Your points, I think. Jenny, what is your story? Uh, the headline is, Even on Somerset Police, Executed 12 in Twitter gaff. It's from my local Western Supermare Mercury. Okay, and 15 seconds, what's the story? The Avon on Somerset Constabulary um, posted 28 arrested during day of action in Somerset West. We have arrested 28 people and executed 12. And it actually meant to say executed 12 search warrants. <laughs> wow. Okay. okay, Shrub, what's your news headline? Um, woman arrested for threatening uh, seagulls. Um, it's a local news story about a woman who found some unexploded bullets in her garage and proceeded uh, to go down to a canal and throw these bullets at some seagulls independent of the gun in the hope that the dog would swallow them. Okay, and Carla, your headline, please. Four-year-old boy becomes mayor. <laughs> right, 15 seconds, go. Um, a town in Minnesota... Picked its mayor by pulling names out of a hat, and this year they pulled out the name of a four-year-old boy, and they're sticking with the rules and making him mayor. Isn't that a really undemocratic way of choosing one's mayor? I don't know. I. It's not for us to debate the headlines. It's <laughs> just for us to determine whether they're fact or fiction. So, Jenny was first with the police executing twelve people. Shrub, do you think it's true or false? False. Carla? I also think it's false. I think there would have been more of an uproar. Okay. Woman attacks seagulls. Jenny? No, that was shrubs. Yeah, I'm asking if Jenny thinks it's true oh, or false. Sorry. sorry, my bad. Wake up, Carla. I'm sorry. I'm I, think <laughs> I think Carla, it's false. Carla, do you think that one is true or false? I think it's true. Okay, and last of all, four-year-old becomes mayor. Jenny, true or false? False. Complete and lies. Shrub? I'm going to say true. Police execute 12. Jenny, was that story true or false? It was true. No. Oh, dear. No one actually died. It was just a... Uh, oh, yeah, but still. Jesus. <laughs> we just all thought it was hilarious. Get on with our lives. <laughs> just laugh and move on. That's what we do in Western. That's how we do things. Okay. Woman attacks seagulls. Shrub, true or false? False. It was uh, a sort of slightly embellished version of something my mother did once. <laughs> I thought your imagination was probably weird enough. No, no, my mother uh, once rang me uh, when I was at uh, but I haven't got much. And then half an hour later told me that story about how she found unexploded bullets and tried to get rid of them by throwing them in the canal at Seagull. As you do. Indeed. So, um, so that was false, so... Carla, Carla went true there, if I'm looking right. It's true. The four-year-old mayor was true. Yep. Uh, it's a town in Minnesota called Dorset, which has 22 people in it, and he is now mayor. A little boy called Robert Tufts. Did it say whether he was the youngest in the of the 22? The youngest. He, he's the youngest mayor, but there had been a five-year-old mayor once. Ah, oh, I wonder <laughs> if there are any sort of... Newborn Only in America. Of 22 that, that, that felt sort of bitterly disappointed at, at losing out on what they felt would have been a thoroughly just, uh, justified uh, mayoral appointment. I just thought it was a beautiful story. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's disastrous. Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He might, he might be a thoroughly competent governor. He might be so. the best ever. There, yeah. there was a video. Yeah. He, he didn't look like he was too with politics, to be honest. <laughs> Time for the final scores then. Series 2, episode 3 of the 11 o'clock waffle. Last place, 26 points. It's Carla. Yay! On his debut on 29, it's Shrub. Yeah! I, I'm and for that. Storming into the lead. Watch out, Edgar. Watch out, James. Especially you, Lucy. Jenny on 35. This week's winner. That's all, I've ever, that's all I've ever wanted from life. Do you feel accomplished now? I'm so happy. It, it's a big... It's a big title to have, winner of the waffle. Yeah, I feel it's quite a big responsibility on my shoulders as well. How am I going to cope with the, the fame and the adoration? It, 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 the yeah, riches. I know. <laughs> That's off the uh, people demanding autographs and paparazzi. Yeah. So, I'll bow down before you this weekend. <laughs> Chris Stanley, my chaperone me at all times. 
<laughs> my bodyguard. <laughs> I'm sure we can arrange that this weekend. That'd be great. Okay, so that's it for this week's show. Um, follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. If you go on YouTube, um, which is where you have to go to listen to us, you'll of course know we have some fantastic artwork and logo now, courtesy of Ashlyn. Um, Shrub, do you, do you want to do a little shout out for Faustus before yes. Friday? Anyone in the um, Falmouth area? Do come and see uh, the production I'm co-directing of Dr. Faustus, performed by Feckles. God knows why I, I bother with these people sometimes who have just come into my room and attacked me with beer cans. <laughs> but yes, um, <laughs> Feckles presents Dr. Faustus at the Poly Falmer this weekend, 17, Friday the 17th, Saturday the 18th of May. Tickets uh, book online from www.poly.org. Please do come along. Show starts at 8. There is a scene where we beat up the pug. It's all fun. Me and Jenny will be in the audience as well, Woo! and Emma. We've in, got our we tickets. Were, yes, we were exciting. all in the waffle, so you should come and meet your heroes. <laughs> I'll I'll be there too. Don't forget. Oh, and Mac, yeah, the host. It's it's essentially Hi, it's essentially a Feckles performance slash a waffle convention. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and on that bombshell, we bid you goodbye. Everybody, take care, and we'll be back next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.